Let the magic begin. Hey, Bambos. Good afternoon, Andy. Welcome to another day in paradise. It's just you and me. Another day in paradise. You know that song? Not, it's certainly not sung properly. <laughs> not sung probably at all. But I, yeah, I know. I think song. it was Genesis or something like that. Peter or Phil Collins. We are on today with Josh Witten. Josh Witten. And Josh is a dear friend. He's done incredible stuff. Uh, Translock was a company he founded. He sold it to Ford. He uh, is doing Make Soil. He started a permaculture uh, uh, environment in Northern California. He started one of the first urban gardens in the middle, I believe it was Portland. He'll tell us where that was. But So he's done a lot of things to save the planet. And he's got a lot of big ideas. And he's one of the more... I would say fascinating individuals. When I speak to him, I see my mind always expands. And we're gonna to talk to him today on A, A Wonderful, Wonderful Chaos. Chaos. Here we are. Good. <laughs> Andy had a panic moment. He thought <laughs> we were muted. <laughs> it's so funny. Sometimes when we play the song, the, it goes mute. So all we see is this little mute button. And I was like, okay, have we been muted all this time? How are you today? <sighs> I'm good. I went to the, to the um, horticulture garden in Amsterdam. I also noticed that I drove there and I went to go get a wonton soup which I haven't had in four months because of the lockdown. And it's in the red light district. And I noticed how sad I felt. Like I wanted to cry because there was this, the emptiness of the streets and the, the sort of feeling like this is, this is the way the city is. It, it, I got used to the city being this beautiful, quiet place that just felt grounded. You know, in a city, you can often feel not grounded, but during the COVID crisis, everyone was gone, all the tourism, you felt really like, wow, I can be in a city and there's not the chaotic cacophony of drunk British people, you know, walking the red light district. There's a lot of Germans now. Yeah. 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 I have it also like in the park when I'm doing my workout or meditating, like now you've got airplanes all the time. Yeah. Like it's, it's it, like going back to normal. Going back to normal. Lesson not learned. Yeah. And there was, there was a beauty of just that calm. Every day, two hours walking, I shot at least 50, 60 pictures a day of just things I would have never have noticed if the streets weren't vacant. So now I, I, what I've noticed is that I walk the same exact streets that I walk with Ronnie, but now I didn't notice the details anymore. Too much distraction? Too much distraction. Yeah. You know, I didn't feel like, all this air and I can just look, it's more like there's people I need to avoid this or, you know, whatever it is going on. Yeah. And how was it for you? The COVID. Just life in general. Hmm. I felt like today I gave myself some rest mm -hmm. and it felt that I haven't given myself any rest. Yeah. Been on the go really plowing through like i sometimes envy some of our guests who seem to just manifest things like they bump into things and things happen and in my life it feels that i have to make things happen yeah and yeah just spent the day like i worked a bit but i really felt uh, just this mm. this sensation we also had a long talk off air but yesterday, which it was yeah. intense to say the least. Yeah, we yeah. did. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, Andy pretty much held my hand through me uh, releasing a lot of tears. Yeah, it's beautiful. And now we bring Josh on, not on literally, but on in to join us. And when I think about Josh, Josh, Super intelligent. <laughs> yeah, super intelligent. But he phrases things in a way where my brain is forced to contort itself. 
like everything he says makes sense, but I'm like, hold on, I've never really thought about it that way. And maybe I've heard the same phrase said a hundred times over, but when he says it, it's like, yeah, he's right. Like, you know, one of the things he said, which is always I found really fascinating, he says it so strong, but casually is like, this is the only known biosphere in the galaxy. Like we don't know of another biosphere in the galaxy. And as he says it, I'm looking at him like, wow, that's, that's wild. <laughs> like we're talking billions and billions of whatever billions. And at the end, this is the only one we know that exists. My brain just, just flutters and how he says it, obviously, it, with his just clarity and understanding always, always just, just makes my mind explode. Mm. And he always says as well, which just, just I utterly love is like, we say we want to go to Mars to make it more like Earth when we're turning Earth into Mars. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the, the two is just like, it's just so fascinating. Like, yeah, imagine if we put the same amount of energy into getting onto Mars as we did to making this place stay as green and as lush and as beautiful as we, uh, as it is. I mean, we saw it during the COVID, right? Yeah. Like it, it is possible. Yeah. What like a, a week of rest on this planet gave. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and forcing everyone to come to center and, or not, right. But figuring out what lessons there were to learn and not living the same pattern, not living the same consumerism. Mm -hmm. Like how does that life look? And, he wrote a really wonderful article that was shared like 50, 60 times at that moment about consumerism and what this moment in time gave us an opportunity for, which I really appreciated. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think there was, you know, the one thing I also really wanted to spend a little bit of time on is that a lot of times when we look at people that have done well, like Josh, it's always so easy to project onto them and think that, oh, they had it easy. Oh, it was given to them. Yeah. And, and a lot of times people don't think the background they came from, where, what did they actually, what were they born into? What, how did that, how did that was, how was that something that like influenced their lives and that, what did they have to overcome to get where they are? And, uh, and I'd love to spend some time as well and talk to him about that because uh, even if we are saving the planet, I always believe saving the planet is start is heightening your own consciousness because if you do that, then your behavior changes and then the planet obviously is, is gonna be um, healed through us consciously doing things that don't harm it. So I'm often thinking consciousness is the key to the, uh, the evolution of, uh, of society. I just see that Josh walked off camera. <laughs> like, like the, the one thing I just want to say about yeah. him is that he really does bring change. Like also mm. for you, right? You started your own compost garden. Yep. Um, Yasmin, my neighbor, she went to his workshop and she completely reinvented her garden. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. When someone says, be the change you want to see in the world, it's so easy to say it and not to be it. And when I started working with Josh, um, he basically said, Andy, if you want to work with me, you got to compost. And I thought, how cool is that? Like, it was like, it immediately wanted me to work with him because I'm like, if anyone is that principled, then they understand that every step is important. Each individual you're interacting with has to be an example of what you want in the world. So if you start supporting people who are not taking the message seriously, then how is that? It just makes no sense. So those were the aspects that really uh, inspired me in my, uh, in my time with him. Nice. So without further ado, the man, the legend, the myth, there he is with his backdrop, looking good, nice camera, nice lighting. Slick hair. I love it. <laughs> Eight in the morning for us. Thank you for getting up. Yeah, it feels good to be here. Thanks, guys. Finally making it happen. Yeah, this was the rebooking. Sonny came in your place. Sonny, who's also That's supporting right. the Make Soil movement, took your place last time when you uh, you went to the permaculture area to see what you could do off grid for a while. And I got to find out who Sonny was. It was great. Yeah, nice. So, how did it feel to hear you described by us in these ways? Um, it was enjoyable. It was enjoyable. Um. I think I think one challenge with being sort of problem centric as I tend to be, right? Just like looking at everything wrong with the world and how things could be better all the time. It, you don't stop to celebrate maybe who you've become or how it's impacted people. The mind is kind of just off to the next the next challenge. So it was really 
was really, you know, I was in the waiting room. There's nothing for me to do. I'm like in a uh, compliment purgatory, right? I'm stuck there. Things said about me. <laughs> compliment purgatory. I like that one. We're gonna use that now. Mm. Yeah. So you got you got the quote a little a little bit wrong though. But since it was um, since you were saying oh the way he uses the word. Oh, I knew. By the way, I knew everything I said was going to be incorrect, <laughs> and that you were going to correct me. Let's get that clear. <laughs> each, word, each word is chosen intentionally. So I know Earth is the only living biosphere in the known universe. Okay, and what beyond, did I say? Beyond the galaxy, you said galaxy. I didn't know. I don't distinguish between universe and galaxy. I know so. you. Just <laughs> <laughs> They're different. Oh, the galaxy is small potatoes, gentlemen. To the <laughs> so, uh, but literally, like, so the galaxy is like the Milky Way galaxy. You may have heard of that. There's, there's yes. plenty of galaxies that we know of. And, and when you look at any galaxy, this one or any other, we still can't find a planet that looks like it's alive. Sometimes we get excited. Scientists will say they they found a planet that it's looks like frozen water, looks like ice, total ice. And if it's total ice, it means there could have been water at one time and maybe we'll find, but no, we still haven't found a trace of life, not a fossil, not anything. And mm -hmm. so earth is this, this living anomaly surrounded by completely dead planets. It should give us pause. Wow. <laughs> wow. Just, just the way you said that, surrounded by dead planets. Yeah. 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 I saw a, a cartoon today that was um, kind of a, it was like a polarized America with a line and it was conservatives and liberals. And then it was like, it took a broader, it was like a cartoon that took kind of phased itself out like 10 shots. And then like the 10th shot was like the universe, like, and we're just arguing over this thing. And then there's this massive universe that we're living in that we have no, like, don't even think about how minuscule and how insignificant this, this thing is. Well, and it's, it's a common phenomena that humanity unites whenever there's a bigger threat, right? So, so that, that zooming out effect. And I, I oftentimes say it's it shouldn't be us versus us or human versus human. It's really it's really us versus entropy and us, us versus the, the vacuum of space separated by a thin wisp of atmosphere. Yeah. And if you think about it, guys, you know that that beautiful picture of of Earth uh, that's all zoomed out. It's got that you know, it's just like hanging there in space. That photograph. Um, we only got the first one of those like forty or fifty years ago. I think it only became like publicly published in a way that the average person saw maybe thirty or forty years ago. Wow! If you think about that. Before that point, no animal had ever looked back and seen what it was we were we were participating in really so if you know we'll, we'll go it's time to get get with the program and understand what our situation is but also to be uh gentle with ourselves and realize that the mind has never comprehended this situation before we've never really looked back from space and said oh there's there's the earth hanging among those dead planets and not another living one in sight. Like that is, and so our brain and society are still uh, catching up with that. It's There's like a humility that that has, which makes us less significant. Yeah, I, I mean, even if you think about trying to save the planet, like the whole universe is gonna die at some point or the sun goes supernova and gobbles up the earth so it is a bit mind bending but it, but it's insignificant it's like paradoxical right because it's it, it's insignificant in the grand scheme of things but from the perspective of your experience it's the most significant thing there is <laughs> yeah it's like an ant you know from the, you know if if we if we thought that we gave an ant all the feelings and emotions that we have then all of a sudden if one of us comes and trots upon it then we'd say god this is horrendous but we desensitized ourselves to the point that it's just something that's annoying us. Yeah. 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 I wrote an essay about an ant one time because uh, I realized, you know, when an ant like crawls on your foot uh, or hand or something, it has no idea what it's doing. It has no idea that it's on, on the palm or the foot of a super intelligent animal who on a cruel whim could decide that the ant is gross and just like, you ever just like rub the amp, ant off your hand, but you like, there was too much friction and you just smeared the ant's atoms like across, you know, your skin on a paste. And it was just like, oh, yeah, sorry, ant, you know, 
the ant, if the ant knew that that it was it was two seconds away from that possibility, it would be behaving differently. And you can see it it doesn't uh, it doesn't know what its situation is. And similarly, if if like ever seen like an ant dragging like a crumb or a moth or something, yeah. If you start like tugging on that moth, I guess this is all stuff I've done. This is gives you insight into my childhood. This is, I've just these are all experiments I've done with animals and just learning. But you start tugging on that moth, and the ant is like, "No, this is my this is my moth." It thinks you give a crap about the moth, right? It really. And this is kind of this is kind of like uh, human life fractally. Like there's there might be larger forces at work that, and we're we're just like the ant. We don't realize what we don't we, we care about things that don't really matter. We fight for we fight for things that are kind of silly, maybe. So why do you care about about what uh, about the planet for this moment? Why do you care? Why wouldn't you just let it all go to hell? You know. I often say to people, like, what level of reality do you want to talk about? Because depending on what level of reality we're talking about, there's different different rules, different truths. Mm. And so I've I've at times gone way into meditation and things like this and whatever, dissolved the identity or or touched samadhi or who knows what. But you, you, there's some place you can go where you really don't care about the earth and it doesn't matter and it's all beautiful all the time even the way it's falling apart and everybody's on their journey and it's not really your business to 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 interfere too much and i've gone i've gone to that place and i've been there and i've been thinking wow you know i think maybe i'll spend the rest of my life this way because this is quite satisfying there's no there's no need there's no want and then i i i sit there in that place and then surprisingly something that I might call my soul looks back at me and says, okay, you're having a good time. And I say, yeah, I'm total equanimity. And it says, okay, only problem is uh, you're here to do stuff. And I'm thinking, what do you mean? I'm here to do stuff. Like I'm thought I'm here to be spiritual and sit on my hands and, and, you know, fold my hands and sit on my, sit on my legs. And nope, turns out you're here to do stuff. And it's like, oh yeah. Okay. That's why my head is full of all these ideas of how to, harmonize humanity with with the biosphere and create better jobs for people and create new technologies that you know bring joy into people's lives and it's like yeah that's you know i'm personifying whatever this thing is but it's yeah. like yeah that's why your head is full of those ideas you're, okay you're, but then you th then it meets a society that's not really interested in it how does that feel um i want to go know, back and put my hands under my head <laughs> yeah <laughs> I I used to let that get to me more than it does. That'll that'll wear you down for sure. Um, but it's also a, a kind of a bell curve. Uh, in the bell curve, that distribution, you know, the majority is here in the middle. But you got to find that tip of the bell curve where people are ready for what you're talking about. And so there's a lot of ideas that that die that people have because they're they're good ideas, but the the first 10 people they tell are in the middle of the bell curve and they all tell them it's a stupid idea. But if the first 10 people they had told were on the tip of that bell curve, they would have, they would have gotten it. And so wow. once you realize that's, that's kind of just a st statistical crapshoot or a f a um, function of who you're spending time with. So I kind of know that I kind of know that now. It's kind of interesting because if I look at, for instance, the whole compost, you know, I wrote the article for those that are interested, we can put it in later. I wrote an article on Josh on buzzworthy a really nice article of just our time the last few years together. And the thing that um, that I found so fascinating is that is that as you share more and more around your journey, around composting, around touching soil and getting back to nature and having this experience of seeing, you know, you often talk about the, the, what, what, the cycle. You actually, what is the, I forget the word now. Feedback loops? The feedback loop. So that the feedback loop that we don't, we're so far away from regenerating anything that we have no, we have no experience of it. So we don't even know what the hell it looks like. Right. And uh, I've noticed that in my life and in consciousness around me, since we've known each other, it's even shifted. When people yeah. say regeneration, it's not just a word anymore. People have an idea of what that might be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Increasingly, they do. And, and back to your earlier point, I, time and time again, I've seen things that are unheard of today in three or four years or five years become commonplace. So we just know that's the cycle. And regenerative is 
it's kind of up for up for that um, cycle now. And conceptually, it's becoming uh, more understood that we need to go beyond sustainability and actually, because we've kind of done so much damage to the earth now, we need to become um, really masters of repairing and regenerating the earth beyond just trying to use 10% less plastic in our water bottle cap or something like that. By the way, by the way, I want to do something right now. Yeah. I interrupted you right now because I was trying to tell Bombos yesterday that I'll interrupt people to ask questions. And this is an example of me interrupting someone to ask a question. So now Great. I'm interrupting Josh and I want you to ask the question. Because <laughs> you had a question, did you? I, I did, but I like, yeah, the thing that comes up for me, Josh, is also when I watch your Facebook videos, there's you can come across as really harsh to my mind. But <laughs> when when I take a deep breath in and I really feel into you, there's so much love there. Yeah. There's, there's so much love which carries your words. Mm -hmm. And like my mind's like, where that where like when I see you as a person, like he's completely shut down. Mm -hmm. And then I, and then all this love, like where does that love come from? <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you feel that? There is a lot of heart. I am feeling it. I feel it. I feel it. Thanks for yeah, you're really that out. a paradox because in a weird way you're quite heady, and yet you're so loving, and it, and it's hard to make sense of that. Yeah, I'd say I flip flop between the two of them a lot. But what's beautiful about what Bombos just did is it it can it can can turn on a dime. You know, it just takes a second to to be there, and. I mean, guys, there's times I'll I'll just start crying because I'm I just see something beautiful. Beauty really gets me, you know. Um, beauty really gets me. I'll tell you a funny story that's maybe more in the heart direction, uh, and also phenomenologically bizarre. And that is, uh, I was thinking of my parents. I was doing these. I was learning how to make videos, as as Bombos uh, alluded to my uh my covid quarantine skill acquisition so i'm uh learning how to make videos and i've done a couple and i'm learning fast and they and then i thought about making a video for my parents and just just all the scenes i would do going on little walks with my phone talking to them as if they were there saying oh let's go look at this now and i just started i started weeping with the the beauty hmm. of just feeling my heart open to them. And plus it always been this tension about buying them stuff. I don't like to buy stuff. And, and now there's a thing I could make for them that they would, they would value and love. And I just started weeping to think of making this video for my, my parents. And then I, I didn't though, I went back to whatever I was doing. And the next day, my mom sends this long email about how beautiful the video was that I made for her and the music, the choice of music and the photos. And I'm just like, wait, what? So it turns out that shortly after having this intense emotion of feeling my love for my parents through video, though I did not make a video at that very moment, my parents, or sometime after my parents, iPhone, kicked off some kind of photo album auto generated movie retrieval program and notified my mother that she had a video to watch inside of her photo app. And they don't know how to use their iPhones. They've never seen this feature in their lives. So they click on this button and there's this whole video of memories of our past and times together. And she, it was a bit of heartbreaking when I told her it was AI. It wasn't me. It was <laughs> Because <laughs> her and my dad were actually fighting about whether it was auto-generated or whether her son had done it. She just knew her son had done this. And I said, guys, here's the thing. I didn't do it, but you're not going to believe it. I was weeping with the thought of making a video for you hours before that happened. And I was just, did, did I do it? Did I do that with my mind? Or was the power of the heart and the intention so strong that it reached across the ether and mm -hmm. wow 
But I have, to, I have experiences like that all the time, guys, which tells me, you know, and this was before the internet got so fast. So I, it's not just Big Brother. I think there's, yeah. there's more going on out there. I think there's forces that we'll discover over time. Hmm. Energy. Yeah. And yeah. I've had this experience of my mind being as kind of active and strong as it generally is and my heart being wide open at the same time because i find mm -hmm. a lot of people shut one down or they think they're at odds get out of your head get into your heart this kind of thing but i've had this experience where it feels more like the mind drains into the heart the mind enters the heart and there's a communication yeah. and there's a unification and that's the heart mind you see this phrase the heart mind showing up online so i think maybe maybe people are having this experience and and when you're there that feels like the next step in human evolution what sure. i what i've associated that with is i i call it often channeling because mm. what i feel is that i'll i'll speak and i'll be listening to myself to see if, what if it makes sense so I won't actually think about what I'm going to say before I say it. It's more like, mm. I know I'm in a state. I'll let yeah. that state be. Yeah. And then the words come out. And then I'll be listening to the words as, as if I haven't spoken them. Right. Yeah. 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 And then I'll be surprised sometimes. I'll be like, wow, that's that's really clever. I got to write that down. Totally. As if, as if it didn't you know, come from me. Totally. Yeah. Totally. People say that to me all the time. They're like, what did you just say? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Repeat it. I don't know. <laughs> So, uh, so George, speaking of your parents, and Andy said you had a, a rough childhood. Do you want yeah. to do, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. It's one of those things where I feel like I've talked about my rough childhood so many hundreds of times that I'm kind of over it. But I can really? reach, I can reach into the archive. I haven't heard about your rough childhood online. Uh, no, no, I don't mean online. I mean just in conversation, whether yeah. with a therapist or a friend or a sharing circle or a authentic relating night. I mean, it, there's just, I think you can understand there's been reason to touch into that hundreds of times now, but at some mm. point it's kind of like, I'm just glad to be here now. And I'm yeah. just, I like who I am. And if that took that childhood to do it, then, uh, then so be it. Uh, so if, but if I touch into the, into the archive here, uh, oh, and there's, if you guys ever read a, um, um, Oh, Angela's Ashes. Do you know that book? I yes, I do know it. Yes. Yeah, the audio version is incredible because the author reads it in this thick Irish accent. And he, you know, he says, My childhood was, of course, a miserable childhood. You know, it's just because <laughs> <laughs> everybody could probably make a case for their childhood being miserable. But, anyways, the motif of mine. I had like a Montessori kind of preschool kindergarten thing. They said, hey, this kid is super smart. He's ready for the big leagues. Put him in first grade. I show up at first grade at four years old. And uh, it was a great plan, except school. The, I did not go into a Montessori school or a Waldorf school or any kind of interesting school after that. I went into a pretty rough public school. So it was a great plan putting this super smart young kid into a bigger school with older kids, except the school had really nothing to do with learning. It was, learning was not <laughs> what happened at that place. It was like a beauty contest and a football match and uh, some kind of kids training to be street, street thugs or something. So I pretty much just went catatonic for 12 years, sitting in my desk as teachers said, wow, he's such an underperformer. He doesn't live up to his potential. And, and to me, I was just like in prison waiting for my sentence to be over. And then and then everybody at that after a while decided I was a reject. After 12 years, they said, "Okay, well, his grades are terrible, and he's uh, not a good church member." And um, and uh, so all of our institutions uh, have failed him, and he's uh, let's just uh, write this guy off. And I could feel the moment society wrote me off as a 17-year-old, and uh, my dad suggested I join the army, maybe. Um, and, uh, and the moment everybody wrote me off, I just came alive and I said, thank God, nobody's trying to change me or fix me or teach me anything. Now I'll just get on with, with what I find interesting. <laughs> and so my life sort of began at, at, at 17, a couple years earlier, I started to, to, to rebel and, uh, take life into my own, into my own hands. But, 
so I've been a big advocate for just those those autodidacts out there, those self-taught learners. There's there's kids who are forced to go to schools and sit there and be taught material and their mind says, "This I don't know what this is for." And if I don't know what this is for, I can't really put any stock in it. And those kids when left alone, they are super productive, they teach themselves, they follow their curiosity. And so it's really it's really sad to me to see uh, kids curiosity really damaged by uh, institutions. When that's there, it's an evolutionarily conserved mechanism. You know, when you were a caveman and you walked outside, you f you followed your curiosity. You know, you didn't like sit in one place waiting for an animal to come and attack you. Like you had to notice things that were interesting and make decisions about them. So we have that mechanism and you have to really suppress that when you get into these institutions. Yeah, I mean, mm. the one thing I've seen over and over again is that we don't even realize how much we bought into the education system as it exists today and how little it has to do anything with what's useful for us after we've finished. <laughs> it's just Well, and take a survey of your friends, how many people use their degree on a substantial basis. And I don't have one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Bombos, I think there was a time when somebody would look down on that. And now mm -hmm. I don't think people do anymore. No. I don't, I think people are just like, cool, you were probably doing something else. <laughs> Yeah, you were really learning something while I was uh, sitting in a class. <laughs> right. Uh, mm. Yeah. Mm. Like your photography bombos. Like, I when did you when did you wake up one day and just realize like, hey, this is this is for me. I got a I've got a good eye, or I could get into this, or whatever that moment is. Yeah. Yeah, that was two thousand nine. Yeah. And how was that? Like, think about. Like from now, from then till now, that's eleven years. Yeah, and you would you would now say be one of the premier photographers in the city. Yeah. Like, how many Google reviews do you have? Hundred and sixty. Hundred and sixty reviews. Uh, I'm I'm the second ranking. Wow. Right now, and that was Good ten photo. years. Yeah. Yeah. We could probably completely reinvent ourselves every ten years or less if you thought about it. You know. Well, I, I think we're going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a choice there. It's change. Yeah, I, I've just become an author. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, it's too early. I can't remember what I am at this moment. No. Well, it changes depending on who I'm talking to. Uh, like, my, my one of my favorite videos of you is you making uh, a compost thing out of just, I think you found like a metal chicken wire or something. <laughs> and I was like, of course. <laughs> I, li I literally was walking by a trash can lid, two segments of uh, metal mesh. And, uh, and then I found like a paper clip and I thought I could invent a new kind of compost bin out of that. <laughs> and, <it> was, <laughs> and you and did. For, and I did. And for actually for 10 years, I'd known about I'd, I'd had it in my mind to build to build that design, and I just had to walk past all the, the apparent garbage lying on the ground to do it. And, and now we get all kinds of emails. Like people want a, a more detailed build. They want to see how to turn the compost in it, and and I've actually got ideas for like new versions of it. But it's just mm. it's just funny. It's like sometimes the simplest thing that, and it makes you question how much effort does life really take? Because that was just. I was just goofing off there, you know. Um, you know, there's something that, that we had a we had a guest on whose name is Claudia Jungstra, and she's all about regenerative uh, uh, re regenerative art and, and and ecological thinking ecologically around her art projects. Yeah. And as she spoke, and I, I had a lot of thoughts on you, is that she's often talking about, of course, the inconvenience of doing it, but it's never seen as an inconvenience because there's discoveries being made over and over and over again, which make it like in this unendless journey and discovery. The inconvenience of making her art? Well, not the art itself, but oh, I've got to figure out how to make a dye and the dye comes from an onion. Oh. And that onion hasn't been used in this and we need to use three different types of onion because this onion makes this yellow, this is orange. And and when I when I'm looking at this new evolution of society, we're going back to understanding how things were on their origins yes. before we just said, let's just buy a chemical version of it. And uh, and I think of you because, and her, 
similar quality is that I remember on our talk with her, her eyes lit up when she would talk about the figuring out a new dye. Right. It was like a new color that would have existed during Rembrandt's time. So how did Rembrandt get that color in the painting? And for me, it, 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 there's a quality to, to both of you, which is like, how do I, how do I figure out what it is? Not in this futuristic, how do I get to Mars sort of world, but how do I get back to the simplicity of this thing that once existed that we've forgotten it? I, I really enjoy the, the getting to the essence of things and fundamental processes, right? Uh, Henry David Thoreau, I think he went to Harvard, but he said, uh, I would have learned more. You know, they made me stay in the dorms, but I would have learned more if they just had us build the dorms. Hmm. And he said, I took a metallurgy class and at the end they gave us a pocket knife when we, when we graduated. He said, I would have learned more if we'd had to create a pocket knife. Mm. scratch right and think about that like i've never seen this before but I, I guess like you yank rocks out of the ground and you figure out which rocks do what and you melt them high enough it's smelt them i think the word is and like mm -hmm. metal comes pouring out and and you can anneal that metal and i mean i'm just those are the fundam those are fundamental things that society has discovered and it's great that we don't have to make every piece of metal ourselves but but the fact that any of us I don't know how dye is made, you know, but the fact that any of us can uh, learn any of that stuff almost at any time, you're like 20 minutes on YouTube away from understanding these questions. It's profound. Again, like, like seeing the planet Earth from that far away, we've never been here where times are kind of scary, things are uncertain, a lot of systems are failing us, and we can learn anything we want to learn very, very quickly. It's unprecedented. I think, I think your biggest message has been People, grow your fucking food. Start growing food. Totally. <laughs> and on that list of fundamental things to get cozy with right now, it's understanding understanding the food system, how plants work, befriending befriending nature. Um, you know, there's and there's so much misinformation or just uh, misparadigms going on out there. Like like for a while, like almonds were the hated food, right? Because there was like all these articles about how much water they take, you know, yeah, one, gallon, one gallon per almond. Right, right. So you see all these very conscious people like uh, shaming each other for eating an almond, you know, yeah. and it's just kind of like, but think about that. Like are almonds bad? It's like, no, 50,000 almond trees growing in the desert is bad for the planet. Yeah. But an almond tree in your backyard and in your neighbor's backyard that could be watered with the leftover dishwater, I mean, that'll save your life. Hard times come. You have yeah. an almond tree. You have an avocado tree. You have an olive tree. And, we, and we've got, you know, we've gotten this kind of like sophisticated stupidity now where it's like people don't remember stuff like that. Um, we're so sophisticated and, and so many layers, you know, there's, there's, People, there's whole there's whole subcultures of people gaming credit cards for rewards and buying stuff and returning stuff and getting points. And but don't don't remember that a an almond tree and an avocado tree and an olive tree in their neighborhood could save their family's life. And it's time to get um, friendly with these plant organisms and animal organisms because we actually have to team up with them to to save the planet and ourselves at this point. You, you know what I found fascinating is there seems to be like the most obvious thing to do, and yet it's never done. Is yep. that on these tree, these like line streets, the suburbs of all of America, you've got these massive front yards which are being watered, you know. And I've often laughed because sometimes one of the neighbors will just have a fruit tree in the front. Yeah. And then I, I've seen some communities that each neighbor will grow one tree. Yes. Okay. And in, mo in modern times, though, nine out of ten people would not trust themselves, and they would think it was it was poisonous and dangerous to to pick that fruit. And you'll see this. Like I love going on walks with people and um, grabbing something and eating it, and they're going, "Is that edible?" And usually, I say, "I'm pretty sure," because I can. You know, <laughs> there's not a lot of there's not a lot of like yummy fruits in nature that are just waiting to kill you. They're just like, I'm going to trick this person. And I look like a delicious apple, but I'm really poison. Like that's not what they evolved to do. They didn't. Um, so if you're thinking, you're thinking of berries, berries, right? Berries are a little bit more tricky. Berries can be more tricky, but there's not a lot of delicious poison berries. Really. There's some like 
weird kind of nasty ones, you know, but uh, um, so you'd say you take one bite and you'd figure out, Oh, I don't want to eat anymore. It just tastes bad. That's another thing you, you, you can generally get away with uh, chewing it and spitting it out and, and sampling it that way. Few, mm -hmm. few poisons in nature are so bad that it's going to knock you over like that might be a mushroom that does that. Mm -hmm. um, but also there's little rules like any berry with a little crown on it is generally edible. You know, the little crown, like on a blueberry, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's too it's actually where the flower was, guys. I, I was at a party the other uh, the other month, and um, I had to tell like a Stanford graduate like how flowers relate to fruit. And I was like, well, you know, there's the, f the fruit comes out of the bottom of the flower. There's like on the apple, you see that little that little flaky, papery part on the apple. That was a flower there, you know. And she's just who knows what she studied, but it wasn't wasn't basic stuff like that. And you don't learn basic stuff like that anymore. And it's time. Yeah. That's about that. If things get much worse, that's going to become the most important kind of knowledge. If yeah. things get much worse. It's hard to see how they couldn't, right? Yeah. Yeah. I do hold out some hope that aliens will just land at this point and we'll all just, <laughs> we'll just show us the way. And <laughs> that was that song with uh, what was this lead singer from Jane's Addiction? We'll make great pets. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Farrell. I have I have a movie script uh, plot that I want to make one day, but I'll um, I'll sacrifice it here anyway for the moment. And uh, it's like all these other movies of aliens coming to Earth, and there's this big battle, and they are trying to enslave the human race, uh, and then they win, and and we're enslaved, and then it slowly becomes apparent that they don't want to enslave us; they're just sort of like trying to get us to behave and they're going to leave as soon as we indicate that we can take care of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Twilight Zone episode when the aliens come and they give us the book and then at the last section it says um, serving man because it's a recipe book on how to eat the human uh, race. Oh, oh, you right. ever see the Twilight Zone? Oh, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's interesting because with you, you know, your mind comes up with so many ideas and then you'll latch on to one and composting, make soil was one of those ideas. Transloc earlier was one of those ideas. So what is it about these ideas that say, okay, it's this one I'm going to choose and not another one? Yeah. And that's, that's a struggle internally. Cause I would, I would rather latch on to all 12 at the same time, to be honest. Um, my idea of heaven is sort of working on each of those ideas in a day in turn with teams that are making them happen. But the, the reality of things or my own limitations are such that uh, you have to pick one at some point. And you're generally of, I, I quite often start ideas uh, at the same time, multiple ideas, and I look at which ones reality seems ready for. Um, mm. What is reality, I like to say, what does reality think of your idea, right? Mm. Feedback from reality. But I mean, yeah. sorry, just to interrupt you for a moment, composting in that reality, every time I spoke about that reality to any, anyone, they all said, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. Right, right. And so I started with the question of how do you get hundreds of millions of people to, to actually embrace composting, uh, which people have been trying for decades. And I just, this, the way the mind works, the way the subconscious works, just little by little, I got the pieces. Like, well, we'll stop calling it composting, call it, call it soil making. And then that gives rise to identities, new identities and roles like the soil maker. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can see how, hey, become a soil maker seems way more compelling than you should really be composting, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I want to be a soil maker. What, what's a soil maker? You're a what? You know, so it's like that identity. So just these little pieces would come into my mind uh, of that and then little innovations like... Um, well, if instead of char charging each person with the responsibility of learning how to do this well, all you were asking them to do was find a neighbor who already knew how, that would make it much easier. So yeah. all this stuff just kind of falls in place in the mind. I'm kind of running all these simulations all the time, and the subconscious does a lot of a lot of the work. And then you just find yourself so compelled. There's enough pieces, and you just say, oh, my God, this could really work. And then you find yourself working on that at the exclusion of other things. Mm-hmm. I mean, the one thing I know you do exceptionally well is you exclude what distracts. If I had to say like a skill that I see you do exceptionally well, anything that is not critical to it functioning that distracts, 
um, you you just say, no, we're not doing that. And what I've noticed, especially working with developers, they <laughs> often they often like to put all the bells and whistles in because they feel like we, you know, in the terms when I was when I was um, in in IT, we called it feature fucking. Yeah. Um, because if you can put in a hundred features, what that's better than two. And and what I've often seen you do is you say, no, we're going to do these two, and we're going to do it so well that the user almost feels compelled to do it because it's that easy. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm good at looking at a project and saying, what is the essential thing, the essential quality that must be there, the essential function, and we can worry about the 100 nice to have features later. And mm -hmm. many projects fail because they're full of 20 weak, nice to have aspects and they never they don't find the the essential quality of of what the what the initiative is about mm. you find that essential quality like with my first company uh transluc um we were barely a real company uh we were a bunch of kids and we were talking to like real transit agencies and we had real real competitors who had track records and clients already. And so it's like, how in the world are you going to get a, a legit government agency to take a chance on a bunch of kids, right? And I knew we only had like one shot. And I had this idea that we could put buses on the internet in 2004, which wasn't really being done. And you could, and we were going to, we were going to make them move around just like if you were watching a video game, because I played a lot of video games, and we're, it was gonna it was gonna look like a video game, but it was gonna be real, real time, real object, a real bus moving around, and then it just it had never been done in history before. But I I knew that the technologies that would enable that had just in the recent year matured enough to that point, and I I knew if we made that demo everything else would take care of itself and they would for, they would forgive all the rest we would blow their minds with that demo and it was hilarious cuz look the demo only worked for like 30 seconds before it crashed because internet browsers were so they were like they could barely handle anything moving and doing animation inside of them at that point so we had a good <laughs> had a good 30 seconds from when we hit start <laughs> And one of our colleagues you know, riding around on the bus holding this like lunchbox that looked like a bomb full of tracking equipment. Again, we didn't get permission, right? We just put a guy on a bus with tracking equipment, just riding the bus. <laughs> and um, and I would take meetings like uh, I would say, let's have our meeting like next to a window where uh, uh, one, on one of your bus routes, you know, where a bus comes by or something. Uh -huh. And just for this moment where people are watching the screen. And these transit administrators are saying, I don't get it. This is a, a movie. And I'm like, no, it's not a movie. It's real time. And they're saying it's it's a simulation, and I'm saying no. This is ex this is exactly where your bus is right now. And look outside the window. Three, two, one, and the bus would go by. And you see, suddenly it didn't matter that we were a bunch of kids or we didn't have any real customers or whatever. So it's it's wow. that quality. I'm pretty good at driving driving toward. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that very very much. And obviously, the when I went to makesoil.org site immediately. You know, when you go to a site, you immediately have a reaction to it. Like it's a very kind of visceral, like, oh, yeah, yeah. They just took a standard thing and put some lipstick on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and when I went there, obviously, I just said, wow, I, I just want to play. It's like I wanted to play. Yeah, It was the invitation, which I find always that kind of thoughtfulness creates a whole different experience. Yeah. 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 Mm. And we're going to keep going. There's there's such a there's such a feature roadmap there to make it more and more enticing and more and more fun. And really, I think it's going to end up being a bit like a role playing game. You know, when you when you these role playing video games, they they invite you to step into a world and to acquire a new skill, mm. uh, and you don't know a lot about that world or what your options are. And the the role playing game is really a beautiful kind of interface, which is the amount of information you need to learn in the role-playing game is daunting. And if somebody just handed you a manual and said, start from scratch, you'd never start playing. But they just, they give you enough learning at the appropriate time that you're just excited to keep going farther and farther and farther. Yeah. So I think, I think that's a beautiful uh, interface and way of teaching people. And it just needs to be appropriated now for stuff that matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I remember when I was playing a lot of video games, which this only happened a couple times in my life, but um, in my adult life. But I would notice my character on the screen, you know, get stronger and more stamina and more wealth and whatever. And I would eventually realize that my my real life character was having the opposite experience. I was getting poorer and, <laughs> and less dexterous. And, you know, like, it was like, wait a minute, my life force is pouring into uh, this video game and leaving my my real life. Yeah. So. Okay, I've got a question for you. So this is why I want to interrupt and then have you ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> After yesterday, we've had this funny thing, Vambos and I have been discussing. Dangerous when, co-host, Vambos. When, when someone talks, I'll start to feel into where they're going a bit. And then at some point, if they continue on that path, it'll kind of be more information that's maybe necessary to get that one point across. Mm -hmm. So I'll put a little intervention in and say, hey, I've got a question, which meant that Bambo sometimes would be sitting just like, okay, how, did, how do I get in here? But I was actually trying to keep the flow I don't I'm leave like, a lot of room. You got to just interrupt. So, I, so, so I've been laughing now because now when I do it, I want to say, okay, Bambus, this is, you know. This is the point. This is the point. So I'm, 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 I'm going to be like, oh, and, oh Bambus and, has a question. <laughs> <laughs> Normally I tap him on the leg when I want to talk. Yeah. Uh, and mm. actually, truth be told, I was really into your story. <laughs> <laughs> that's the man a good time, Andy. Mm. Oh, that's great. Yeah, there really are these different communication protocols, though, mm -hmm. where uh, it's not it's not insensitivity or anything like this. I mean, it can be, but there's people who just uh, G.K. G.K. Chesterton said there's uh, two kinds of people who talk too much: one who loves the sound of his own voice, and another who has no idea what his voice sounds like. And I'm more like that one. Like I like you interrupt me, and people say sorry for the interruption, and I say, "Did you interrupt me?" I don't. I didn't notice. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I always think it's. I always. I always take it as a flattery when people interrupt me. Yeah, they want to join. They they've got something to add, right? Yeah. Like I was thinking, nothing I had to say was that important. So right. wh why would it matter that you've now? Of course, that's right. Uh, something I said triggered you. So let's go down that path. Yeah. I think that's. And, there's, other, and there's no right or wrong here, but then there's other yeah. people in other groups where they. They need a good three seconds of silence before they can enter, and there's there's beauty and and function to that as well. So. Yeah, or the or that idea that I'm not being heard. Oh yeah. Well, when you put these two groups together, <laughs> you're in trouble. Hold <laughs> 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 on. To that point, I I used to go to these philosophy debates in college mm -hmm. and uh, after college, and I just loved it. I loved. I love I love debates, and um, I went to this one, and uh, I I just I probably like dominated the debate or something, right? And I just like, and but there were people there who were open minded and willing, kind of Socratic method. We actually did yeah. change each other's mind through this debate, if you could imagine that. People talking to each other, changing each other's minds. That used to happen apparently. And I walked out of there, and I said to my girlfriend, I said, that was, that was an amazing time. I had a great time. I think everybody had a great time. And she says, she has horrified look on her face. She said, didn't you see that woman crying in the corner? And I was <laughs> like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was too busy digging the well out into her soul. I didn't know she was actually bleeding. <laughs> I was too busy slaying my uh, interlocutors. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about like intellectual prowess when a person isn't looking to really learn and grow, but defend themselves, yeah, it's uh, it's it's scary for you know, it's scary. Yeah, or when people are looking to learn and grow, but again, because of this communication difference, you just don't think you can even speak or ever be heard. That's that's the, that brings up a real existential terror, I imagine. What go on that? What do you see there? Well, the person who's uh, who's seeing this intellectual quick witted fast pace no empty space no silence match ensue and then they feel personally like they there's no way for them to to be seen or heard or participate or or change anyone's mind i think that can induce a real existential terror of like do i do i really exist am i am i going to experience have a life am i going to experience life or am i going to just kind of be in a weird non-existence here so yeah. yeah i was talking to ronnie about that today and um it was an interesting topic because uh, i said there's some people in my life i've noticed that if uh 
if you say or you're strong or can you know if you if you if you speak from an experience and then they don't feel confident in their own experience that they'll often uh, blame the other for uh, for taking up space oh, yeah. not or whatever it is and and I laughed because Ronnie um you know she she'll often take the side of the other one she said so what is it that you're doing that doesn't allow that person or, or that makes that person project onto you. Mm. And I kind of yeah. laughed and I said, well, wouldn't it be interesting to say, what is it that that person isn't capable of, which would give them the confidence in their experience. So they wouldn't yeah. need to feel that they're being stamped, stomped on. Life is tricky. Cause you know, this, I know what it's like to hold space for people. And then I don't talk like this. I don't, run the room or share any ideas and but maybe you do that for a hundred hours and then it's been a hundred hours since you expressed yourself and you think wait a minute like it's one thing if you're getting paid for that but at some point you're just you're just hiding yourself under a bushel or whatever the old biblical term is right so yeah. Yeah. take some space yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah you, I'm, you, I'm, you i'm making up for lost time because i had those 12 years of when i started out where i took up no space so yeah it's kind of interesting because as you ha are evolving, you are becoming more and more of a voice. You're yeah. standing in the, in. I've often seen you as kind of standing as a voice for nature. Yeah. You know, like who is the voice for nature? If everyone, you know, we have uh, Dr. Jane Elliott coming on. I don't know if you've seen her or are familiar with her. She basically did the blue eye, the brown eye, blue eye experiment, 68. She just, challenged oh, no. everyone on racism mm -hmm. she just basically in in a not a gentle way okay. she was not not forgiving not trying to have you understand she basically just shoved it in your face and now you got to deal with this reality mm. you know and as and as a teacher and as an educator she wouldn't want it to be as an educator and white and you know she was like she was like the voice of she could be that voice and in some ways i would say those voices if they're not loud strong, succinct, people don't see the contrast because it's really easy to go into this sort of auto mechanic in your brain that doesn't think. So it's I see people like you and her forcing people to look at what's really going on that make a, a massive shift in the world. Yeah, I would say I don't force people like you can always turn your back on me and change <clears throat> the channel, um, but certainly not not hiding and the message, the message, there's the message and there's the messenger, right? Mm -hmm. So there's many voices for the planet. Uh, and what's weird is that right now the planet especially, especially needs essentially guys who look like me to, to care about the planet, right? To talk about the planet as mm -hmm. much as they would expect a scientist to care about the planet or a park ranger or a native elder in some other part of the world. Uh, it's time, it's time to stop uh, acting or, or, you know, for, for caring about the planet to be their job, some specialty job of mm -hmm. some kind of nature person. And it's like, uh, no, like, well, you by the way, when you yeah. say people that look like me, just to make sure we clarify, we're talking about a venture capitalist that's trying to focus on getting business and not only in the plan. What do you mean when you say that? Just to make sure. Sadly, Andy, I don't think I need. I don't. I think we all know what what what, what I mean when I say people look like me. But like uh, like I might be stereotyped as a uh, like a businessman or a techie or or one of these things. And and really, like my my connection with nature, my. <clears throat> since I was young, it's, it's been there. It's been there as much as any, you know, any, any, um, <laughs> so, sometimes, know. sometimes when you're talking, sometimes yeah. when you talk, it looks like you look to your left to uh -huh. get an answer and then you come back. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. You know, Elon Musk does that too. If you ever, if you ever like with him, he'll just like, He's just out there. I, I I spent I spent those twelve years like that as well. But yeah, uh -huh. um, I do go look for that answer. Uh, but it, like loving the planet and having good ideas of how to take care of the planet, it's time for ev everyone to have some hand in that now. Yeah. Uh, 
not not for that to be some specialty specialty role. Yeah. And so as a, my point was, there's plenty of people saying the right thing, beautiful things, useful things about the planet. And it's just my little uh, niche um, to look the way I do and have the life that I do and to care about the planet just as much. And uh, the messenger and the message, the message yeah. matter. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like uh, when you, I used to do the same thing with consciousness. I would talk a lot about uh, uh, healing and consciousness and and whatnot. And uh, the same thing that a yogi could have said or a psychologist could have said, uh, but they would have been dismissed because it's like, well, that's what a yogi would say. That's yeah. what a psychologist would say. That's what a therapist would say. Um but, you know, I was talking to some friends once and, and they're like, what are you up to? And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm like healing, and like, healing. I thought you were a, like a hard charging, successful entrepreneur. And I was like, yeah, but I, I stopped. I finished one of those runs. I took a lot of damage. And so now I'm I'm healing. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but you're so ambitious. And I was like, OK, well. Next time you see me, I'm going to be the most healed effing person you ever met. You know, <laughs> how's that for him? <laughs> just kind of like, I thought. remember ambitiously had, healing you know i just think it's fun to mix these things together i had with my dad you know we we had falling out after falling out after falling out and i think after 10 years we hadn't spoken and in that time i became the director of the company and did the public thing so i had you know i was the the, the lone wolf or the black sheep in the family we had spoke for 10 years and then he came, we came back together and i'd done so much of my own personal development i just started talking from a lot a very clear clean space and then I remember sitting with him after not meeting for 10 years. And he said, you know, Andy, like everything you say, it sounds like really impressive. And I have to admit, if you didn't start a business and create all that success, I wouldn't trust a word you say. <laughs> it was just so interesting because it was like, yeah, like he needed that idea to be resolved in his head. Otherwise, he's like, no, no, you're just, you know, you're blabbering. just blabbering. Yeah. You really, you really got me. Now that I'm staring at all of us on the screen here, you've really got me uh, thinking about this comment I made about uh, uh, people who look like me. Because it's more subtle than that. It's even like, it's like this haircut. You know, like I just got a haircut, and for the podcast, um, no, but I'll say yes, definitely. <laughs> you know, I knew this was coming, and I made sure to get enough sleep and to iron my shirt. Uh, um, you forgot to iron the backdrop. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I knew uh, Bombo could see that, you know. Yeah. I even have a steamer. I have a steamer I can use on it. I just <laughs> put a green screen behind it. And it was it was crumply. Um, uh, and I'm using a webcam instead of a real camera. It's painful. Um, but it's like people need to 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 know that even somebody with this haircut like legitimately cares about the planet, not just about the stock market or finance. Or, I really don't care about that stuff. And you know me, like I. Yeah, I never have. Right. It needs the planet needs, you know, people need to see somebody wearing a sweater like this who actually loves the planet and knows something about nature and ecosystems. Right. Yeah. And watch what people do to show that they care about the planet or love like they let their hair grow out and they get some maybe some yeah dreads or something and they wear a shirt that's just just ragged enough. And it's Recycled. just that's what I mean about them. Yeah. The Got it. Yeah, yeah. That's what I would have thought, actually. Yeah. 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 Because it's funny because we often sequester and stereotype the people that would be interested in certain things, which is a lot of this show. Because, you know, the one thing, you know, you may or may not be aware, but we're pulling people all across the board without any distinction, like, oh, it has to be one type of person that comes on, right? We'll have the drag queen on one day. And then we'll have somebody that's a philosopher on the next day. Diverse then, shows I know of, absolutely. absolutely. And, and, and the whole idea is, is like, it, it can be meaningful, it can be fun, and it can be like open regardless of the topic. So why do we need to sequester it? So I'd rather that everyone see, wow, it all could fall under this umbrella of dialogue and beauty and humor and not like, hey, we have to go to one channel to see how you can be successful in business. Exactly. I yeah. think those days, those days are are over, and and you, you, we know they're over because people don't watch fifteen videos from the same YouTube channel anymore. They yeah. they're skipping around all the time, and they uh, don't. That was that's aside from yours because it's wonderfully diverse at its core, right? They yeah. Can, yeah. 
so so when you said people that look like me uh, I had an image actually I o I only see your voice like you, you're actually in the shadows yeah. I don't see you great yeah that's the idea mind works that way good yeah. I think I you know I I grew I'm I'm, I'm drawing on I don't want to go too far into this because it's a uh, it's it's an unnecessary kind of uh, pain to dwell on but there was a long period before now guys where um, I would go into the tech world I would go into tech groups, CEO clubs, whatever. And, and the, and talking about the planet being in trouble, especially 15 years ago mm -hmm. or consciousness where I was uh, growing up in the Southeastern United States, like, uh, there wasn't an interest in those circles when I would talk about that stuff. And I would just, my nature was to kind of hammer on that stuff to keep, I'd be the annoying guy at the table who would just keep talking about like, like, well, you know, like money doesn't matter if the planet, if you don't have a working planet, you know, I would just say these kind of almost inflammatory things, but I, I couldn't believe how little interest there was in those circles. And then I would go to the environmental club in the environmental circles because I, I was not only a tech CEO, I was running a community garden and teaching people how to make soil 10 years ago. And there I hid the fact that I, um, was a successful business guy because they hated those people. It was like you mm -hmm. had the, they were the problem. Business was destroying the planet. And so I would hide that part of myself. I had friends who for years had no idea what I, what I did. And then I would, uh, you know, go to the spiritual groups or whatever. And many of them hated the business people as well and the tech people. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> I keep hiding. I'd leave two thirds of myself at the door uh, to myself everywhere I went. And, and mm -hmm. so now my life is just about saying that's I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to mm -hmm. uh, be a whole self and really the answer to humanity's of flourishing from this point forward and all the challenges we're facing is that the, the answers, the legitimate answers are at the intersection of um, business technology and a legitimate love and understanding of nature. It's, it's at the end, it's where those, where the, that Venn diagram, where those circles overlap, all the legitimate solutions will be at the center of that Venn diagram. We don't have any more time for these camps mm -hmm. sniping at each other and, and being so disintegrated. Mm -hmm. yeah. With that, we've gone o well over our hour. So I think we're gonna end it on that one if we can. Thank Pleasure. you for being with us. It was really great to be with you. Pleasure. For people who are watching, then you can see Josh and read what he's doing on joshwitten.com. If you want more information on the composting that he's working on, it is makesoil.org. And if you want to see the article that I wrote, which I thought was fantastic, if I do say so myself, you can find that on Buzzworthy. And that is a featured article that's been on. I think it's still the top article there for the moment. So. With that, it, I send you a hug and thank you for being with us. Yeah. JohnWitton.com, right? Jo JoshWitton.com, Josh, not, oh, not, oh. not, not John, Josh. Sorry, I called you John. <laughs> I didn't notice. <laughs> Good night, John boy. <laughs> thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. It was great being with you. Talk to you later. Oh. Mm. Wow. Oh, I lost the, there we go. That was great. Mm. It's another week, Bambos. Yeah, sixty-four sessions, sixty-four shows as of wow. Can you imagine COVID? We had we didn't even this didn't exist, and now we're sixty-four in. Just crazy. Actually, it's more, but we just didn't quote yeah, ourselves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would be set over seventy for sure. Yeah, and um, yeah, because we we started with an iPhone, guys. Yeah, just an iPhone <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> we must have had twenty, maybe even before we started doing it more formally. Yeah, yeah. And great. I mean, each day so different. The people are so varied and they kind of carry us in different directions each day. It's really beautiful. It's like a it's almost like a like a candy and you don't quite know what it's gonna taste like until you put it in your mouth and then you say, Oh, that's what it tastes like today. Yeah. Hmm. Next week we'll announce the shows for next week coming on uh, Sunday. I don't even know who we have on yet, but I'm sure it'll be a fun lineup. I don't remember. Yeah, as they all are. If you haven't already, please do go to Facebook or YouTube, YouTube and like us because we don't usually ask, but it is deeply grateful. We have 600 so far.
So six, we crossed the 600 mark today, people following us. And uh, the more people follow us, the more people that want to be on the show are more interested in us. So we get better, we get better and better um, guests that uh, that are um, maybe even more well known to the public eye. The first question they ask us is, "What's your platform?" Yeah, like we want to get people like R Russell. I'd love to get Russell Brand on. Yeah, Russell yeah. Brand. I'd love to get Sting on. Sting is not like my hero from childhood. <laughs> like I have my stretch goals. We should sort of like put our vision board of who are the people we'd love to have on the show. Yeah. Yeah. So th I think that comes with time, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> we got Jane Elliott. I really wanted Jane on Elliott on the show. And we got her. So that's really exciting. I think you should get Oprah. Oprah. Oprah on the show. Yeah, that would be a fun one for like, sure. There was a chapter in your book that you... I went to her house. <laughs> you went to her house, but that chapter was not in the it book. It was cut. Yeah, I went to her. It was so funny. I spent an hour walking around her like a stalker only to see the security guard come after me and say, <laughs> what are you doing here? And I think I may have saw her because I was actually walking and then she drove in, if I'm not mistaken, if she was driving the Tesla. And then she stopped. She stopped midway in the driveway. It's a pretty far drive. And she just, and I didn't know why she stopped in the middle. I thought she may be looking in a rear view mirror to say, is this someone who I want to turn around for or not? But uh, that was the funny, funny moment. Got cut from the book. Thank you guys for a really another wonderful week. It was great to be with you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time on, on A Wonderful, wonderful Chaos. Chaos. <laughs>